Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. It may interest you to know. My name is Tony and Marcolini, and I am, I cannot really find the words. Uh, it's the first time you find an attorney being stumped, right? I cannot find the words to say how honored I am to have Emmy Award uh, winning, uh, Glo Golden Globe Award winning actress Sharon Glass with me today. Uh, welcome, Sharon. Well, thank you, Tony. I'm, I read your book, uh, right, and absolutely fe fell in love with it. You, I mean, I'm, I'd, I'd like to say I'm an obsessive reader, right? I read uh, two books a week. Uh, oh, I, read, I read almost every genre except for science fiction, right? And so I read a lot of biographies. And for me, the litmus test, you know, for what makes a great biography is that I feel like I'm, I'm sitting and having tea with just, a, you know, a witty, uh, engaging person telling me cool stories about their life. Uh, right. So you really ring the you really ring that bell for me. That's the sense I got when I was reading. You know, I read it in one sitting. I'll say that. Oh my you God. Kept, you kept me up till 3 a.m. because I couldn't put it down. <laughs> I'd like you to feel like you were sitting having a martini with me. <laughs> Those are the good old days for me. <laughs> well, for me, it was a nice cup of green tea. Uh, I'm good. And, and soaking it in. So I want to get into as much as I could possibly can with you. Of course, you've had an illustrious career of so many projects. Uh, and, and again, your, your book is, it was an amazing window into that. I, I mean, as far as biographies go as well, I liked Michael J. Fox's biographies, right? Because his humor, I think, and his intelligence come through. And that's not an easy thing to do in that, in that form, I think, because there's a tendency of, to just well, this happened and then that happened, but you really do weave us through your life in such an engaging way that I found the same thing. Your humor and your intelligence really shown, showed through. Um, so that I want to start. That's my gush in the beginning to tell you. How much <laughs> I, like I, I wanted that. I wanted people to, I mean, some of it's sad, but I have, a, it was important that my voice, you know, really be heard like I, like I speak. Um, and Writing is not a skill that comes easily to me. But I knew the feelings I wanted to project. I wanted to tell the truth, the sad and the happy. Um, the What was amusing to me is, as I'd go along, Simon & Schuster was my publisher, and they'd interject things like, could you spice up, give us some more dirty words? And I said, absolutely. Because <laughs> I do tend to throw them out there, you know, and then I would pull back because I thought, well, I don't know, this is the reading public, but they said, no, Sharon, it, it goes well with your voice. Just let it go. So occasionally I did. So thank you for telling me you enjoyed it because uh, that was my hope. That was my hope. And I mean, I, I want to I want to talk a little bit about different portions of it, but I also want to get into certain projects that you've done in your career. Um, certainly, I think the first time I became aware of you was with Ro uh, the, the show with Robert Wagner, right? Switch. Um, that's while you were certainly acting before then. That's like the first time I think I ever saw you on anything. I can't believe you're old enough to have seen these shows, but God bless you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, but I do remember, and and I have to say, I used to watch it with my mom. My mom was a big Robert Wagner fan, so that's what brought us there. Uh, but you were my favorite character on the show. That's how you stood out. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That was my first, like, nice part. What was it like the first time? Because you had to have been familiar with Robert Wagner. By then, he was a relatively big name. I, I guess was at Eddie mm. Albert at that point. What was like you liked your first scene with them? You know, I don't remember my first scene with them. What I remember the most is my first audition. Um, um, when I went into audition for RJ, for Robert Wagner, I was about to be, I didn't know this, but I was about to be fired from Universal Studios. And I didn't know that. Um, but I went and I met him and to sit, I was so young at the time and to sit across the room watching this icon, this 
gorgeous, lovely man who had that sweet smile, you know, I mean, he's famous for that wonderful smile. He just sat there just smiling at me, knowing my heart was pounding, looking at him. I got embarrassed. I'd look away and I just, I couldn't maintain eye contact with him because he was just too, he was Robert Wagner, for God's sake. Um, he couldn't have been kinder. And I just had this new short haircut done. And um, the producer of the show said, well, I don't know. I, anyway, I read for RJ and that's Robert Wagner. And um, the producer said, well, I don't know that short haircut. How can she do undercover with this? And RJ said, uh, Glenn, that's why we make wigs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he was feeling it already from the interview. I'm guessing he felt a certain uh, uh, comedic, I guess, energy with you or uh, uh, something to pulling I for you. Already. I amused him. I think I amused him. Um, yeah, the I remember the scene, the audition scene. It's it's a scene where my character, the secretary, um, has to answer the phone late at night, two in the morning. They've kept her working, and she's asleep. And she has to answer the telephone. And she screws up all the names of the of the title of the company. In her sleep. <laughs> and I and I could see him smiling. You know, it's not a slap your thigh moment, but it was her having to make a mistake and recover. Um, and I I got the role. What's odd is the description of the character was a Natalie Wood type. Well, check it out. Do you see anything? It looks like Natalie Wood. Here I am a blonde, I'm a big girl. Natalie was very slight. And um, I don't know why I was asked to be seen, but RJ Robert Wagner called me at the beauty salon where I was having a facial. I said, like, I'd like you to come over to the house and meet Natalie and me. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Bob. You know, I didn't know him well enough to call him Marjorie. Sorry, Bob, I can't, I have cream all over my face. And I think he thought this was sort of charming. So then he called me like two days later, was told I was at the beauty salon. I'm having my, my roots done. I was always honest. And I think he thought it was disarming you know, that, Anyway, I think he found me charming. So he asked me finally for the third time, would I come to the studio and meet him? So I went and I didn't know it was a Natalie Wood type, but I saw the script. And I don't know why he picked me, but I asked him later, I said, did you know that I was being fired from the studio when I read for you? He said, yes, I did. I said, you did? Is that why you hired me? He said, no, I'm not running a charity. I hired you because you were the best for the part. And um, anyway, we lasted three years together. And it was, it was the most wonderful, yummy. I learned so much from the two of them because I was a beginner. Sure. I mean, what I found, I found interesting too, somewhere in your book, you talk about, I guess, your early acting coach, Estelle, I think her name was. Mm. Uh, and you, you say after she passed, um, her, I, I don't remember if it was her son or daughter, but but somebody daughter. said, her daughter, then somebody, she said to you that her mom changed the way she taught after you because you acted from the inside out. Um, you know, yes, which I, I did. That, I, didn't, I didn't have any training, but my instinct was to start from the inside and present you know uh she taught more from uh costuming and i don't know different exercises she had us do but it had nothing to do with inner work and i'd never been in trained before as an actress but i knew that's where all my stuff was was inside so um anyway she told i was very flattered she told her daughter Years later, when I auditioned for her, I understand that she said that is the worst performance I have ever seen. And she took me, though, as a favor to somebody. And I was in the teenage class, and I was in my 20s, 26, when I auditioned for her. 
but at the end of her life, she did confide to her daughter that she changed the way she taught acting because of me. And that, that only is a tribute to you, but I think that says something about your creativity. You know, what shines through in all the characters you play is that you've made each one your own, right? They're all clearly very different. There isn't much of a common thread between most of your major characters. Uh, and creatively, you embrace them. And I think that's one of the reasons I even wanted to talk to you, because you're incredibly creative. Right? You have to be, because I say this all the time. I mean, the, the, your, your business is very collaborative, right? It's uh, the writer who creates on the paper and creates paper character, right? And then there's the actor, the actress who breathes life into the character that gives them their nuances and their quirks and uh, what, what makes them, you know, alive. And of course, there's, you know, your director, your cinematographer, people who, the visual storytellers who weave you Thanks through. Thanks so the Right. And then the editors who pick the best cut. I mean, it's so collaborative to get to a final product, for, you know, and I get that, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, but your role in it is to breathe life into that character. And so every character has to take, I think, an enormous amount of creativity. And what what was, seemed to be true throughout the book is that every character you took, you had a gut for them, right? You're like, I knew this character wasn't this or wasn't that. Uh, and, and I guess I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that too creatively. I like to focus on that um, in the podcast often. Where does that come from? I mean, is this something that you know instantly when you read the paper version of the character? Does this like your creativity, does it marinate in your brain? Like you've read it and like a week later you're in the shower and you're, you know, and you're thinking about it. And you're like, you know, what would be really good for this person? I mean, where, where is, you know, what is your process, your creative process? Um, gosh, that's a really good question. And I don't think anybody's ever asked me this. Um, because I had a limited training, um, I go, I, normally I go by the seat of my pants, by my gut. Seat of the pants is too easy. I don't mean that. I mean, I just go by something inside me. Um, I had a wonderful teacher, a Russian gentleman named George Donoff. And he used to call me professor because he said, get out of your head. You're always in your head. And um, I said, okay. So he assigns the scenes to us for scene night. And he respected us so much. He wore a suit and a tie for his students on scene night and no agents were let in. This wasn't about getting a job, you know, in Hollywood. Um, it was about learning to be an actor. And I walked in that night and I was doing the scene with St. Joan where she appeals to the Dauphin to, to um, lead the army. Right. And so I walked in that night and he said, well, professor, how, how are you feeling tonight? I said, I'm, I'm nervous, Mr. Stanov. And he said, well, the good news is the audience doesn't care how you feel. They only care how Joan feels. <laughs> and I thought, God bless him. Of course that's true. Who gives a shit how I feel? It's absolutely how the character feels. Now, I'm sort of shy to, to, to act like I'm an authority on all this. I'm not. I'm not a method actress. Um, I'm not even quite sure what that is. But I know if it feels right. I'm grateful when ideas come to me about a character that are readily received and, and, um, and very welcomed by my producer. Um, I sort of experiment as I go. Um, well, that's interesting. So you're saying you read paper character and you get a gut for that character. Uh, and then sort of when you're, 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 you're starting to engage uh, with the, you know, with your, whoever you're acting, your scene partner, uh, that you try different things. Like you're saying it's more of a creative process for you kind of ebbs and flows as you go. It's not something yeah. that, yeah. Oh yeah. I just don't uh, do my first sentence as a brilliant, brilliant. You know, I don't. I I go by 
my gut at the time and also what my partner, how she responds. Or I learn also from my acting partner, you know? Um, hopefully we're very different. It's like Cagney and Lacey was written very differently. Um, one of the most nervous times for me as an actress is when I came into Cagney and Lacey because I was now the third Cagney. Um, and I thought, well, what can I do differently to save this? Because it had been, the show was going to be canceled if I didn't deliver. So they brought me in and uh, Tyne Daly came over to my house. We were going to have a, a script reading. A lot of, most series have readings of each episode before you go on to the next week. And now I'm the new Cagney, so they brought me in. It's their last chance to survive. And Tyne Daly had the brilliance to call me up. We didn't know each other very well. And she said, may I come over to your house? I think we should read this together without anybody watching us. I said, great, thank you. I was, I was afraid of imposing myself and I don't even know if I was bright enough to think to do that. But um, so she came over and we did it like five times until we sort of got it about each other and about the character. And I don't know how to explain that. It's just instinct. I don't mean that's the end of it. That's just the beginning. Because um, we're put in different situations as each week goes on and you start to realize who this person is. But to tell you anyway, so Tiny and I did this. We didn't know each other, but we read, read through it five times. Then we showed up the next morning. And needless to say, she was the third time playing Lacey, and I'm the first time playing Cagney. And I was nervous. But Tyne and I had done some work together just to know how, the meter of it, you know, the, and, um, and our attitudes towards each other. And um, Barney Rosenzweig, our producer, after the reading was through, he said, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how it's done. Yeah, that's a bravo, right? If oh, I'm my right. God. I was just so, oh, thank God, because I'm looking at all these actors who've been playing with Tyne, three different attempts, and here comes the blonde, right? Mm. Um, but it ended up being, a, 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 it was great. There were certain things they were writing for Cagney that I didn't approve of. Um, costumes, I didn't approve of for her. Hair, I didn't approve of for her. Um, and I thought, well, I better speak up. Because they, they had me a little uh, ferrofosity. That's how, um, anyway. That's how they were sort of presenting me. And um, I just knew it was totally wrong. So they allowed me to change my look and change my attitude. And Tyne was very generous. I asked, I'm sure you read it in the book. Um, I asked her a huge favor and she had every right to say no. But she knew and I knew that if she gave me that permission I was beginning to know exactly who Cagney was. And I was asking her in just only one instance to take a back seat. I thought, man, you can tell me to go screw myself because I know I just got here. And she said, you know why I want to say no. I said, yes, I do. She said, and yet you still ask me. I said, yes, I do. She said, if you feel that that's who your character is, and that I would allow that, she said, let's give it a go. And we did. And it was as simple as me saying, do you mind? Because we're always running indoors and with guns. You know, I mean, we were doing something that women on TV had not done before. And guns drawn and, 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 and trained by the police how to do it. And um, I never thought I was quite as good at it as time. I've seen the show, obviously, many times. And went, oh, really? Um, but emotionally, I knew the character very well. And Tyne agreed to it. What it was is I said, Tyne, I think Cagney would enter the room first. 
I said, I think you have children. You know, your character has children. I have none. Um, all I want to do is be the ch uh, chief of police. Um, Cagney just didn't have the, 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 the fear or the self-protection. She ended up being shot in the heart eventually. She wouldn't wear a, a, a jacket. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, but it was her, it's who she, I just got the, the, it was who she was. She wasn't cautious. And she was the child of a cop. And she, um, later we find out, was a drunk. Um, she did things that weren't safe. And I thought, Mary Beth, if she'd let me do it, Mary Beth had children. You know, she was smarter, a little more cautious. I don't mean a smarter cop, just smarter in that she has other people to protect also, do you know, besides the world. Um, and she said, you know why I don't want to give you, why I don't want you to do this. And I said, I know why. She said, but if you think this will make the difference in our characters, I said, I do. She said, then I say, go for it. So that for my character to ask the character, Tyne's been playing her character for three times. I'm brand new and I'm saying, do you mind if I enter the room first all the time? And she, it's the most generous thing I've ever had an actor do for me was to say, go ahead. Well, unequivocally, I mean, the show winds up, I think, being, uh, the, you know, the iconic show that it is because of the chemistry between you and Tyndale. Oh, absolutely. We had nothing to do with that. I don't think actors have anything to do. With, they could not take credit for chemistry at all. But the man who put us together, Barney Rosenzweig, he saw it and he fought for the two of us to do it for years. And, and it's what, it, what ultimately works. It did. Um, you yeah. touch you touch upon too at the you know when they eventually reveal that your character has a problem with alcohol, you have these incredibly dramatic scenes. Uh, you know the one in particular where this is all, your ultimate breakdown. I want to call it. I mean I don't know how else to phrase it's, it. I always call it the scenes you've never seen. <laughs> right. You don't know are going on. Yeah, I mean, it's, and I was, guess I was wondering, because it seems like the, the amount of emotion that would have to go into that level of drama is probably an odd question, but is that a one take kind of a scene? I mean, are you, you having a kick to, to go deep like for that over and over at multiple takes? No, there were remember? some scenes, there were some scenes that um, were more quiet and sad. Those, I was given more takes. Um, they were very emotional. Uh, but the act, the scenes when she's really drunk and she's moving and, and, and um, the, the camera, how that camera followed me, only once I saw a little wee, but it didn't matter because it made her look even more drunk, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And um, they just followed me. They, in certain, we, I always called it scenes we never see. The scenes we never see of what she does alone in her apartment. And I asked Barney, our producer, I said, when I enter the apartment, would you let me shoot in sequence? Because nobody shoots in sequence, you know, it's too expensive. But he said, yes, once you enter the apartment, because I didn't, I knew how drunk I was starting, but I didn't know how far to go. And I needed to know what I had done and so how, how much future I had in finishing this terribly tragic. Um, it was really good stuff. I didn't write it, folks. In fact, when Barney showed me the script, he said, no one else has seen this yet. I wanna know what you think. And I took it home and I came back the next day in his office, I said, it's brilliant. Who are you gonna to get to play it? <laughs> I didn't think I could play it. Yeah, I didn't think I could do it, but um, they were very patient with me, and and um, it had it got a tremendous response because no, there'd never been a hero, male or female, on television who had a flaw, who had a disease, who had something like alcoholism. They just didn't do that, you know. You didn't go home with them, they aren't like they did on Cagney and Lacey. Um, that's what makes your show so brutally honest. 
right? It's one of the first few times where, you know, they capture life connecting more to reality uh, than, than the average show. Yeah, and we had responses. We did research about this when we were first were gonna do it. We did research about women and men and alcoholism. And what we learned is when men are drunk at a party, they're considered amusing. When a woman is drunk at a party, she's an embarrassment. And that's how it was. So we said, let's just do this. Let's show them the worst part of it. And we did. There was a history before that she had. It's not like overnight. Her father was a drunk. Uh, she was always drinking with the neighbor or her father. Or something. She always had a glass in her hand. And we even started a funny thing before we were going to make her really fall from grace. I used to tell Tyne every night morning when I walk in to sign in at the precinct, I said, just have your hand automatically out. Don't smile. Just have two aspirin. <laughs> she knows she must have a killer headache. And I just take them. Yeah, no, I mean, but that's somewhat that's that's you and and Tyne, I think, oh, yes. and making those characters who they are. Is there a moment? I mean, when you come and you mention that you come into the show, you know, you're the third Cagney. Um, but is there a moment that you can recall, um, whether it's filming a scene or the like, that that you say, "Yeah, this is magic." Like we have something. Is it? Well, when did that? When did you know there was magic to it? God, I know there were moments when I did feel that. Um, at least in my experience as an actress, I had not had uh, scenes like that with another woman. I was always working with men. Um, When did I feel that? The magic. I mean, I, ha I have to think there's a moment. Oh, I, I mean, I can remember, and I write about it in my book, but Tyne and I would do, our most intimate scenes were done in what we called the Jane instead of the John, because it's the only place that there were no other women on the force in that precinct. So we'd go to what we called the Jane and have it out, either fighting or confiding or... In, in, in the confines of that Jane um, that were highly emotional and that we could only do with each other. We're respectable cops. We don't, you know, fight in front of people or we did, but we, our most honest moments, whether they be tender or, or um, very combative, uh, were in that Jane. So, I think I mentioned this in the book. Uh, whenever they really became wonderful and as the years went on, they just got better, you know, because we got better, like it goes. Um, I said, oh my God, that was so good. Um, I said, that was really good. I said, my nipples just went up. I said, I said, feel this. She goes, wow. So it got to be, it got to be that when, ever we do a, a highly emotional scene. She would say, so how'd we do? And she'd feel me and say, because <laughs> I'd get chills. I mean, and sure. if, it, if it was bullshit or not as good, you know, nothing happened. You, you also, I think Brian, you did a number of scenes with Brian Dennehy, right? The, the great- uh, I great did, not, not enough, not enough, but- What was he like to work with? He was fun. He was great fun. And we went out drinking with him afterwards um, when I was still drinking. Um, he's a wonderful guy, very wonderful, wonderful actor. The particular relationship between our characters was one that she has a crush on him, is certainly not showing it. And he's just finding her ridiculous, you know? So <laughs> it was fun to play. He was just, he was just always good. I mean, I was, I saw him, I've seen him on Broadway, he was absolutely brilliant. And he was wonderful with us. He just, he, he played it as though his character thought we were funny. <laughs> and it shows you like, you know what? I still remember those scenes, right? Because yeah. they, they were, you know, they were good. There really was a very good vibe with it. So it goes he, to show you. He, he um, excuse me, he um, improvised a line 
we break into his room. He's in hiding out in the hotel. We kick down the door and we go in, our guns drawn. And he puts his arms up and says, he improvised. Oh God, I love New York. Laughing at us. Oh, I love New York. Okay. I like that. Like we were lightweights. Did you get to improvise a lot? That, that's interesting. Or would you say uh, that no. was unusual? Um, they, they, that was so priceless. Um, they kept it in. But no, China and I were not, were asked not to improvise. That yeah. If we have ideas to please come to the writers, they'll probably say yes. But they don't want to be surprised in dailies. We used to do that. We used to sort of do just sort of whatever came to mind. And Barney finally had to come to us and say, the writers are not recognizing their material. <laughs> and we said, oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, some, that's a nice way of saying stop. <laughs> no, or, 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 con, or, or speak to us about it. You know, right. we'll probably say yes. I have to ask you about what it was like to be on the set of the Bob Newhart show. I was so nervous. Oh, my God. Oh, I was so well, frightened. Well, what was that set like? I mean, you think Bob Newhart. I mean, one of the great sitcoms of all time, right? It's sitcom very, so good that years later when he ends another sitcom, he ends it, you know, in bed with uh, Suzanne Plachette. Suzanne, I know, which is brilliant. Um, I'd never been. I was being loaned out from Universal. I'd never this was it, being loaned out to CBS. I think that was their network. Uh, to come and play the youngest girl that the airline pilot across the hall, do you remember? Howard, yeah. whatever it Howard, yeah. yeah. Howard, that he'd ever gone out with, the youngest girl he'd ever dated. And it was the episode was about Suzanne's birthday and how old she was feeling. Suzanne was a teacher. Well, Howard arrives that night with the youngest girl he's ever dated, and she's a teacher. And it was just all done. Not, not on purpose, but by the writers to make Suzanne feel bad. And I was petrified, petrified, working in front of a live audience. And, um, you know, it's not like you can make a mistake. And, well, you can, but I wasn't about to. And um, so I did the scene where I, you know, I just sit and talk to them in their living room. And then Suzanne walks me off the set. And she put her arm around me. She put her arm around me and said, you are wonderful. You were wonderful. And I think she just felt my fear. She knew I was just petrified. But she paid me that little compliment, whether it was true or not. She was that kind. She wore, ooh, she wore on in, um, I wasn't used to having such a, a funny crowd. You know, it was a comedy. I was used to doing dramas on the set, on the, uh, on the lot. And um, she came in with a T-shirt with um, rhinestones. This one, rhinestone T-shirts. It was something about a sparkly pussy. I can't remember, but it was something of that nature. I thought it was so, so funny. And she said, okay, now I want to tell all of you. She said, well, I just got an invitation to do a commercial for women's, uh, a women's, <clears throat> a women's hygiene spray. I said, oh, are you going to do it? She said, hell no. She said, Dorothy Provine goes on national television, tells everybody her cunt smells. Um, another actress says her smells worse. I swear to God. <laughs> this is coming. And I'm just, oh, I loved her. She said, hell no, I'm not going to do it. But I always remembered that. I, I don't mean to offend you. No, but no. That's who she was. She was so just wonderful and out there and didn't give a shit what anybody thought. A great, and a great actress. My goodness. Wonderful actress. I mean, I just to get the opportunity to work with her, I think, had it been amazing. I know. I um I kept hoping that we could have something else together. It never happened. Um, but I remember her before I was ever an actress seeing her in a movie called Roman Holiday. Oh, sure. Very young. She was very young and very sexy. And um, with uh, Troy Donahue. I think they were sort of went together at the time. Um, 
and she was just like the sexiest thing I'd ever seen on film. And her voice was so wonderful. And she just had a style and a natural, just, she was like an old pro. Wonderful. Was he, and Bob Newhart, was he funny off camera? He was not. Um, I don't mean he was kind, but he was very serious and uh, doing other things and didn't sit around with all of us and, you know, talk like Suzanne did. Um, but I did, I can tell you a funny story. I did run into him at a, in a restaurant right at the day after Thanksgiving in Malibu. And all my family was with me. And he was at a big round table and I was at a big round table. And this was Tyne had already won three Emmys. I hadn't won any yet. So the show had been on a while. I tell you that about the Emmys for this next remark. So I think, gee, there's Bob Newhart. I'd love to go say hello to him. So I excused myself from my family. I said, excuse me, Bob. I said, I'm Sharon Glass. I don't know if you remember me. I did your show many, many years ago. He said, oh, Sharon, of course I remember you. And then he goes around and he introduces me to everybody who's at his table. So one of the people he introduced me to was Mr. and Mrs. Don Rickles. And I said, you know, Don, how nice to meet you. And I extended my hand and it was being ever so polite. And I went and sat down at my table, that was just right next to theirs. Now, as I say, China had already won three Emmys. I hadn't won any yet. He said, well, I like the brunette better. Now there's an actress. <laughs> <laughs> He says really loud so the whole restaurant can hear it. I, I loved him so much for doing that. Because it was you, a compliment to me, you know. Oh, to be picked on by Don Rickles, definitely. Be picked yes. on by Don Rickles and say, now there, the, I like the brunette better. Now there's an actress. <laughs> I looked over at him and he was laughing. And to think, it was an interesting story I read. In reality, you were on the fence, right, about Cagney and Lacey or, or doing Cagney and Lacey. I didn't um, want to do it at all. Right. And then Michael Douglas gives you a little piece of advice. So, but for Michael Douglas, I almost felt like that was the little push that you needed. Well, I had already finally accepted um, Barney Rosenzweig's at, um, invitation. A lot, there'd been, we went through a lot to get to it. And it was all about billing and yada, yada. And anyway, they finally decided what they do to handle it. And then I was invited to do Michael Douglas's feature. So Barney held back production <clears throat> so I could work with Michael Douglas. So I already was committed to doing this show, Cagney and Lacey, that I'd never done yet. And I sat with Michael and I'd always wanted to be in the movies, you know, doesn't every young child. And I had lunch with him one day and I just said, Michael, I'm committed to do this series. It's called Cagney and Lacey. I haven't done it yet. I said, but do you think it's a mistake? Because I always wanted to be in the movies. And so do you think I should pass on this series? Like I could, you know. Um, he said, I'll say one thing to you. And I said, what? He said, have you ever heard of the streets of San Francisco? I said, of course I have. He said, enough said. Yeah, I mean, when you think about that, that it, it was a great piece of advice, uh, oh, yes. but the perfect, the perfect way, I think, to, to segue into filming, right? I to didn't realize how powerful television was because I'd always loved the movies, but television is definitely more powerful. You go into people's homes, you're in their bedroom, you know? Now, that brings up an interesting question for me, because certainly you, uh, you were definitely on stage, right? The uh, very prestigious, you know, uh, uh, London's West End, right? You've you did a number of plays. Um, you've done TV successfully. You've done films successfully. Do you have a favorite genre for yourself? Mm -hmm. Television. Television. Television series. A hit television series. <clears throat> I love television because, first of all, I'm good at it, and it has been so good to me. And I love, if you're lucky, I love the longevity of a series. 
You go to a family every morning. You have a makeup man, five, seven years, who insults you, who was in here yesterday, your younger sister, <laughs> especially in my drinking days. <laughs> um, you, the intimacy of a, of a long running series, I can't, it's my favorite thing. It's your favorite genre for yourself. It's my very, very favorite thing to do. Uh, uh, you know, clearly a, a successful one, which I've been certainly blessed to have been in some. But everybody knows you. You know them. The shyness goes away. You know, it, it's 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 um, <laughs> my makeup man once said to me he, towards the end of Cagney Lace. He said, "You know." We were getting tired. He said, you know, Sharon, I think you ought to think about having a facelift. I said, well, he was always saying that. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And he said, I'm just saying, I'm the one who has to make you up every morning. So, I mean, the worst insults. So I- Like a I, brother and sister. Oh, you very but much- That's the something I think my brother would say to me. <laughs> I brought in a magazine in Jan one January, Esquire or something. It says, look, guess what's out? Facelifts. So I took it to Bob and I said, look what's out this year, facelifts. He says, what's in, character parts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're Only describing someone who's been your makeup like... man for, you know, six, seven years could get away with that. And That's I laughed out louder than he did. That's a family, yeah. It's a family. So and I have to sneak in a question about Johnny Carson, right? You know, I can't. I have to ask, I mean, what's that like? I mean, you literally walk out on The Tonight Show, right? I mean, which and sit down and talk to Johnny Carson. I mean, wow. What's yeah, like? it's, there is, there's nobody finer, really. There, there was, he, he was king. Um, the first time I did a show, I was so nervous. And a dear friend of mine was vice president, head of talent relations at NBC. So he told Johnny, he said, you've got someone who's so scared. She's brand new. I think I just played Carol Lombard, but I'd never done The Tonight Show. And um, so he sent a bottle of scotch back to my room. This friend of mine, not Johnny. Um, and I was sitting back there, you know, having a couple of shooters. And it's time for me to go on. And the man says, when I open the curtain, you know, you go over there and Johnny's over to your left. And he'll stand up. Well, I said, Sharon, glass. And then the curtain opens. And there was Johnny on the other side of the curtain waiting for me. And he whispered in my ear. He said, come, he said, come on. We're going to have some fun. And he took my hand and took me over to my seat. I've never seen him do that ever with anybody. Nor have I. Yeah, very kind. Um, and I was new, so he liked me very much because I didn't have clever responses, you know, but um, and he, he kept me on. There was a three person night and he did the first person and I was second. And then they told me, stay where you are. He's going to keep you on for the last segment also. So they canceled the last person and he kept me on. And um, when, um, when he, went to get in his car after it was over. I was sitting there waiting for the car that, you know, picked you up. And I was just standing there and he points at me and he says, Carol Lombard, that's who you are. And I said, oh, well, thank you. Um, then the second time I did a show, he was nice to me, not as nice as he was the first time. And the, sec the third time he was awful, just <laughs> awful. Um, he'd been, had a few drinks and they made me talk about, they give you an interview beforehand and they made me talk about animals I'd had. Well, every animal I'd ever had since I was a child died. And they all thought backstage, this was funny. Um, it was goldfish and little ducks and, you know, and the more I told the story thinking they would laugh like they did, the producers did. Um, he um, kept looking at the camera like, can you believe this? Totally you got one of the infamous looks. Wow. One of the infamous looks. 
And um, there was another comic who was on just before I was a very famous comic. And every time the comic would do a joke, Johnny would look at the camera with, straight, with a solemn face. I think he was just unhappy that night. And what he did was make his guests feel really awful. But I still remember that first night. So I will always, I'll always give him that because he was a, a real prince. Well, and to have been on, you know, to, to have been on the Tonight Show back, you know, and, and it's, you know, Johnny Carson portion, you know, era, I guess oh, I'll yeah. say of it, right? It, that's just an having, to have that in your memory bank. Amazing. Amazing. And, you know, and you, this talk with you is making me feel really how fortunate um, I was in all that I've had in my career. Sometimes you take it for granted. But then when I speak to you, it really was swell. Oh, these are experiences the average person will certainly never have. And no. all the people that you, you've, you've been able to interact with, uh, by all standards, are iconic for the rest of the world. Right. So and, and you are iconic to the rest of the world as well. But I'm saying and you've had all these you know, opportunities, which I think is really interesting. Thank you. I've been very, very blessed, very fortunate. I had a dream of what I wanted, had no training and did train with Mr. Stronoff, that man who used to call me the professor. Um, but I really learned from the actors I worked with on the set. I worked for my, I learned from my fellow actors and I can't ask for better training than that. Sure. They're cars and I watched them. I they mean, were ordinary. And your story is so interesting. I mean, I really encourage everybody to get the book because your story of how you get to that moment, right? You're 25 or 26 and you finally, um, you know, you go back to the house that had been sold and, you know, uh, you finally tell your mother, let me go. Like, let, let me go do this. I mean, you're just driven to like move on in your life. And well, you uh, you're being read led. My book. yeah, you're being led. And I mean, to, to me, and, uh, you know, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the way I interpreted this first arc of your life is all about being invisible, right? I mean, you, you kind of okay. seem invisible in everything, you know, leading up to the moment where you become very visible, right? Like you, you right. burst onto the scene in acting. So it's such a contrast and it's what makes it just an incredible story. It's very compelling. I highly encourage uh, anyone who hasn't read it to read it. The story, and they'll read it in the book, the story about going to my grandfather's ranch in Scottsdale to bring him his station wagon. <laughs> yeah, that's a great it was all one. Set up. I think it was a setup because it was such a terrible time in my life. Yeah. And that was where I was confronted with my step-grandmother over lots of champagne. She said, you're 26 years old, Sharon, you have nothing to show for your life. What do you want? And I think that's the reason I was brought to the ranch because my grandfather knew I had nothing. I was doing nothing. And he said, come and visit Mary, his new wife for a couple of weeks, hang out. And um, that first night I was there, she approached me with a lot of champagne in me and her. And it's worth reading that part because that was the night my life changed. Nobody ever asked me what I wanted. And she forced me to just say it. And I've never said it out loud before. She said, just say it. Give it air. Even if you could never have it. Just say it. And I said, I want to be an actress. I was 26 years old. That's really old. And um, anyway. Well, I, that's what I think. Oh, I think it's a very, very good part. It's a very good story, that piece. It is. The whole story is good. And I think it touches... Uh, in so many different experiences, it, it doesn't have to be just you know an actor, an actor's experience. This is true of anybody. Like, there's, there's a lot of people in the world who feel lost or invisible at oh, any yes. moment and are trying to figure out, you know, how to fix that, right? So, I mean, it's just just a really heartwarming, great story. I mean, you'll cry, you'll root for you. You know, this just this is a lot going Thanks. on. Thanks. <laughs> um, but let, we have to talk a little bit about queer as folk, right? So. There comes a point in time when you get when you decide to do this show on cable. And I mean, for me, arguably, 
you make that show, I think, mainstream uh, the cultural phenomenon it becomes, right? Because while there were, you know, of course, a number of great, you know, other actors on there, I'm not to diminish, you know, not to diminish at all, you know, who play those parts, but they're they're virtually without notoriety uh, prior to doing the show for the most part, (laughs) right? And, And so you come along uh, and you say, you know, I'm going to do it. And you take this character and you make her just this, you know, this is a really interesting, compelling <laughs> woman, right? That that brings notoriety to the show, uh, that makes it more mainstream, I'll say. You know, so it's, it's not just, uh, uh, it doesn't just become a big show in the LGBTQ, you know, world, but it becomes like a mainstream big cable show. Yeah. And I think... And again, not to diminish the other people who did great jobs on the show, but I think that you get the applause for that. Um, so, I ha- and then you did a lot to help create your character on the show. At least you, you tell that in the book. Uh, you know, you kind of know who she is going into it, right? You you pick out the the the, the wig. You know, you know, you want to be this just this colorful. I, that's who she I is. Did. I would also. Uh, in- I'd love to say that I, I did love creating her look, but I also needed to, not, I, I was almost 200 pounds when I got that role. And Ron and Dan didn't care. They didn't care what I looked like, you know? Um, everybody else did, but they didn't care. They wanted, they said, I said, do you know how much I weigh? They said, yes, we saw you in time at the AIDS benefit in Los Angeles. And um, I said, is that a problem for you? They said, no, what we want is your heart. And I said, okay, I can bring you that. But how do I, Christine Cagney was so famous. I made a decision that I was going to totally change the entire look my my husband was mortified how can you go on that show that size and with a red wig and all that makeup and the butter and i said because it's the only way i know how to move on to the next step in my life uh, i i cannot be chris cagney anymore so i deliberately i knew what size i was but i also deliberately told her make made her rather outlandish and um, the the, the uh, producers were wonderful about it. I had chosen, I brought with me like 14 wigs, every color, every style. I thought, well, she changed the wig every day in the diner. And they said, Sharon's uh, showtime. This thing says too much. <laughs> I said, okay. So I we always used the red wig. And there was one point where we had Debbie in the diner faint. And I did a really good job of that. Um, I got an applause for it. I did it in one take, dropping the, in, in, in one take of me fainting onto the ground, hitting the mark, hitting my, having my head hit the mark where the camera was, that, with the wig falling off. That's how we showed the viewers that it was fake. Everything was fake. And um, anyway, I liked her and I was so, grateful so grateful to have that because it my career came back again well I mean yeah I mean I think you definitely show a totally different character right which is what kind of makes you you know the I mean you're the creative person I mean that makes it obvious how creative you are because you take all these people who are very different in different parts of their life and different worlds certainly uh, and you really make them all your own. And that's not an easy task, right? We tend to see people when we're used to them. When we see Archie Bunker, we're used to him being Archie Bunker. It's really hard to see Archie. It seems like Archie playing other roles, right? Like when right. we, and I, I, I think that's know how thing. else to do it. Right. You know how else to do it. If I was lucky enough to get a particular role that I liked or I wanted, then I, I gave it my all. And I wanted everybody to look different and to be different different voice, different. I was just so blessed. Oh, honey, Tony, I've been so blessed. I agree. So so blessed in this industry. And I'm not done. I've got one more in me. 
Oh, I'm confident that you do. Yeah. Um, because I, I can remember back, you know, I, I, I actually remember that show, Turnabout, right? You mentioned it briefly in your book, but it, it wasn't on terribly long. But I remember it because it's just this, it's this interesting thing, right? Your, your husband and you switch bodies, if you will, by some magical thing. I, I don't remember. Right, John name. Shuck. John Shuck played the, played the woman. I played the man. Right. So even though you are, even though you are, uh, you know, you are a woman on camera, you are supposed to be your husband in you, which just made it incredibly funny. And you know, right, it, it I, was I, can remember, I can remember Smith that novel. It was an old Thorn Smith novel from England, and um, some wonderful producers took it and made it into a TV series. But I knew we were in trouble when, <clears throat> because obviously we had different names. He was, I was Sam, and and. Let's say she was, I can't remember what her name was. That was my name. Let's say it was Mary, which is not true. And my mother, I said, so mom, what'd you think? She said, oh, darling, it's wonderful. I don't understand why he kept calling you Sam. And I thought, we're so screwed. <laughs> I didn't get it at all that we had switched bodies, you know, and switched minds. But um, anyway, we had a good time. And I had the pleasure of working with John Chuck. Right. Yeah. I mean, a good actor certainly done, has done a lot of other things since then. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and in the last convertible, I saw you in that as well. Right. A very interesting mini series from back then. Uh, a bunch of great oh, actors cool. start off, you know, at, in that mini series along with you. Uh, kind of a cool very, time piece. Yes. It was a wonderful show when they did novels, you know, in the, in the days when they did famous novels. Um, but it was supposed to be a very sexy role. And my boss at Universal said, you know, it's a very sexy character in the 40s. And I said, I'm just not very sexy. And I don't want to have to do, nor am I good enough of doing, you know, pooch, pooch, Marilyn. I just, it's not, I don't want to do that. And he, she said, just go see the producer, would you? So you never said no to Money James. So I went and I met with the producer and I told him, I said, look, I don't, I, I, I know she's very sexy and she's sleeping with everybody. And I said, but I, I just don't want to have to do that pooch pooch thing. And he said, how about I ask you to do sexy the way you want? And I said, okay. So I went and did it. And the author of the book wrote me after you saw the first dailies. Sharon, I saw you. I knew you were working switch. And he said, the first few minutes of dailies, I just, he said, I fought against you playing this role. I didn't think you were right for it. He said, the first few minutes in dailies, you changed my, you changed my mind. He said, and, and what a and, compliment to oh have the author God, say you the author nailed that. I know. And I just don't oh, thank God. Which are the, these are the early days, like some of your early, you know, early projects. I mean, after, after Cagney and Lacey, I mean, you go on to like the trials of Rosie O'Neill, you play a lawyer, uh, yeah. you know, and you really nail that as well. You know, but Tony, I've never watched myself in anything. Really? I can't, I can't look. But the trials of Rosie O'Neill, <clears throat> excuse me, during COVID, my husband decided since he created it for me. He decided to look at it again. And I heard my voice and I backed up into the living room and I saw myself and I became fascinated. And I sat down and watched both years of it. And it was a really good series. It was really a really good. good series. I was so upset when that show got canceled. And, um, you know. and very politically current. Yeah. <laughs> They're famous today. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I still don't understand uh, the method of why some shows stay on the air and some shows don't. I mean, it's, it's, it escapes me, uh, but that was a really good show. I and again, so. a totally different character. Very. We, we deliberately made it so, so it had nothing to do with Kate. So another odd question. I know that you, when you're filming scenes, sometimes there are these bloopers, right? With scenes where you couldn't, you couldn't, didn't quite get the scene out or done or finished. Maybe somebody had a giggling fit or, or whatever the case may be. A, little, a plane goes overhead. Uh, what is your favorite blooper of all your shows? Do you have a favorite? Like, yeah, this we couldn't get this scene done. This was. 
you know, I wish I had a, a clear answer for you. I do. Rem I don't remember what it was, but Tyne and I kept making the same mistake over and over and over again. And every time we'd, they'd re-slate action, we'd do it. And every time we'd come to that part, whatever it was, we'd just start getting the giggles like a child. We could never, ever get it. Finally, like an hour later, we were like children, could not stop giggling. Now, that's the beauty of having your own show. They're not going to fire. You know. Right. <laughs> but we used to just crack each other up. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a testament to the to the good relationship that the two of you had. But I can imagine, I mean, that's got to be hard. You, the camera, you know, they yell action and you're doing these dramatic scenes. And then maybe to get a case of the giggles has to had to have been hysterically. Funny. Oh, especially if we kept screwing up the same place. We knew before we got to it, we were going to fail. You know, it's just, oh God, here it comes again. Okay, here it comes again. Okay, let's be serious. Okay. Here it comes again, <laughs> and we just can't do it. There was, I'll tell you what a wonderful, what a wonderful partner Tyne Daly is. <clears throat> there was a scene on a roof where Cagney, being the hot shot, runs first, guns drawn, and the perp sees us before we see them and shoots Cagney in the heart. She's down. And I decided. I'm going to cover up my heart because I don't want her to see. It's not written in there, but I don't want her to see. I don't want to see in her eyes what she sees. This happened to me. I don't want to know. So I covered my heart really strong and I just kept looking at her in the eyes. And Tyne Daly, the actress, was trying to remove my hand. And Sharon Gless, the actress, wasn't letting her. And Tying daily yourself, I finally realized what I was doing, that I was scared. And I didn't want to see what she was going to see. And she started improvising and soft talking me through it, you know, Christine. Powerful. That's powerful. Yeah, it stuff. was. And it was never written. But I thought, that's so cool that I don't want to see in her eyes what I know just happened to me. And she, most importantly, realized that I was going off script and she she played with me she's just that good she's yeah so I have to ask you a little bit about that the antidote that you said you're always a big fan of Johnny Mathis right I am and you have a you, he sings you happy birthday one year he does he's done, Johnny's shy you know he's not <clears throat> effusive but he did sing me happy birthday one year. And it was a reel that was made for me for my 50th birthday. And Johnny sings to me. And then a few minutes later, Barry Mandelow, whom I also adore, is sitting at his piano. And he says, so, Sharon, I hear Mathis saying happy birthday to you. He says, well, fuck him. <laughs> and he starts singing. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> now, I have told Barry that he's done this, and he flatly denies it. That's absolutely true. That's a great story. There's not many people in the world <laughs> who can say they had Johnny Mathis and Barry Manilow sing them happy birthday. Well, I'm that old, you know. I mean, they're, they're, I'm, they're my era. <laughs> but that's a great story. Very, very blessed. I know... I know that my life has been uh, a very privileged, uh, not always privileged, but I mean, I was taught how lucky I was. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful for everything I've had. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I know our time is really coming to an end. I wanted to get to burn notice, but I, I, I only had the sh because I tried my best to get to as much as You've I could. You've been an incredible interviewer. You've gotten it all. <laughs> really. You've gotten it all. Yeah, Burn Notice was a, a wonderful, wonderful series. I mean, it ran the longest of any series I've done. And again, another great, different, interesting character. So much yeah. so that I just feel like you kind of... Uh, 
a spy has never had a mother before. <laughs> no, it's very uncommon. Right. Very uncommon. It reminds me though that commercial with the guy on the roof and he's beating people up with the helicopter and his mother calls. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but, exactly. Yeah, but you know, yeah, again, but you make this character your own so much so that by the finale, I, I mean, you're so in, in, intertwined with this with the story, really. That you know, you're you're an integral part of how the show. Did you see ended. how it ended? I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, again, it, 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 it'll of all the, the things that you remember about that show. I I, I hate to say this because I'm not trying to insult anybody else on the show, but kind of like the ending with you is what I remember best. Is well, that terrible? Pretty, I, I I understand that the the, the ending after my ending um, was a uh, sweet and gentle, you know, um, but her ending was memorable it's what i remember best about the show and again not to diminish anybody else a bit of a surprise but yeah yeah a great show again another, a great another, character another wonderful chance for me i followed your career uh, a big fan of your work uh and you know I, I i grabbed the book as soon as it was funny because your publicist sent me the book like before the interview just in case i wanted to check it out and i was like yeah i bought it when it came out i read it i mean <laughs> like thank you but oh, I mean, you. i'm a big fan uh so oh, uh, thank you you've you've made me feel so welcome thank you tony well thank I'll you thank you for being here Oh, yeah, I'll see you in New York. And, and you know what? I, I hope as you do your next project, maybe, maybe you'll come back and talk to me about it. I'd love to. Okay. Let me say, I know the hardcover is out for your book. Right. Uh, I think the paperback is coming out soon. Am I wrong? Coming out in a month. In a month. Well, uh, just in time for Christmas. We're talking That's right. major That's it. great stocking stuffer. A major stocking stuffer. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It's. It's so worth the read. If you have not read it, and I'm, and I'm, a, and I'm a reader. I mean, I'm not easy to to please. I think I had. I set my bar relatively high. Uh, this this book, I, I give a perfect score. Anything you're looking for, it's there. Uh, you tell a great story, and again, I couldn't put it down. I read it in one sitting. Also, the audio has won three awards. There. Do now you I'm do the? I didn't. Re I didn't. Need, were you reading it? Oh, of course. You did do reading. Okay. Because I, I, I read the book, the old school, you know, but uh, I didn't actually listen to the audio. That would be a cool thing to pick up then, too. At if you're one doing point the in audio, the audio, you don't realize you get caught up in yourself, you know? And, and I started to cry at one point as I'm reading it. And I cut. And I said, guys, sorry, let's go back. And my friend who was directing me said, are you kidding? That's gold. Keep it in. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think we did. I don't know. But it was... Um, it was an interesting, interesting thing doing the audio. It's really? more emotional, you know, it's. Yeah. I mean, now you make me want to go have it, you know, pick up the, uh, pick up the, uh, the audio version. I may do it and let's let you tell me your story while I'm chopping vegetables. But yeah, it's, you know, it's a great book. If you haven't read the book, please go read the book. It's, it's very worth the read. Your story and your life is amazing. And I thought you really captured it. And again, it's not just you know, an actress just talking about her life. I mean, there's nothing, uh, there's not a glamorous feel of, of that or bragging yeah. or anything like that. Uh, the, the book truly is, it's, it's witty and smart. Uh, and, you know, I can't recommend it enough. So, and thank you. I was honored to get this opportunity to chat with you. You're a busy lady. I get it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I appreciate that you took a little time to come talk to me. Oh, please. Thank you. And, and happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. Happy Thanksgiving, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Goodbye from, it may interest you to know. Bye. Bye.